feeling sentimental again? Because so am I. Hello guys, welcome, or if you've already seen my channel before, welcome back. I am the Philadelphia Whovian, and I'm going to be doing another video where I rank the stories of classic Doctor Who writers. And what I mean by that is, um, I take classic Doctor Who writers, and I rank all of their stories in from least favorite to most favorite. And with a lot of these writers, overall, their body of work is amazing. It's just, though, my least favorite is there because there just has to be one at the bottom. There we got that. And also previously I've done videos on Robert Holmes, the genius that is Robert Holmes, the epic beauty that is Malcolm Hulk, the cleverness that is Terence Dix, and also the revolutionary comes a Terry Nation who gave us the creatures of the Daleks. So, now we're going to be doing another video on another very, very, very good writer, and who doesn't get enough credit, not only for his stories he's done, but also on the stories he's rewritten, and also the contribution he also gave to the Daleks as well. I'll repeat that, because I did not enunciate well. The, the lot of the credit should be given to him for things he also did with the Daleks. There we go. Hopefully that sounded more clear. And I'm going to throw a couple more disclaimers right off the bat. Um, if there are some, like I'm going to do another video on Eric Sayward eventually and Bob Baker and Dave Martin. But if there are any other Doctor Who classic writers who did five or more stories that I did not notice, let me know in the comment section. I will so rectify that one. And also with David Whitaker, the stories I've seen were eight full stories in total that he wrote. If there are more and I missed it, please let me know in the comment section. I'll fix that mistake in a hot Peloponnesian minute. Yes, I will. Mm -hmm. So, also with this one, here's the one setback. Um, one of his stories I have not seen. It's not my fault, it's just not easy to get a hold of. And that is The Crusade. I have not seen The Crusade because can't get by it any anywhere. It's mostly missing, and also when I try and find it online, I can't find it. So guys, this is a plea. If anyone knows where I can find the um, the Crusade online and watch it, could you please put the link below and help me out so much because I can't find it. So it's going to be the only story that's not on this list anywhere ranked because I just haven't seen it. So now we're going to go with the top seven ranking of least favorite from number seven down to most favorite number one. Guys, whew. David Whitaker, like much of classic Doctor Who, is a genius of a writer. And this story that's the least, um, my least favorite, please don't hate me. I know it's a story a lot of you love. Just hear me out. Number seven, we've got the second Doctor's story from his second season, The Enemy of the World. Okay, there are so many good elements to this story. So many. But my main problem is that I feel like it is a four-part story that was made into six parts. There's a lot of action and things going on, but somehow because of it being into six parts, not four, some of those moments do drag for me. That being said, there's a lot of very good characters here. Um, with Salamander, the second Doctor gives a great performance as this dual character, uh, as a, a great dual performance where he plays himself and he plays the villain, Salamander. Unfortunately, um, it's an accent that no matter how good you are at acting, it's just not always going to be an accent that's convincing. It's just, I would say with accents like that accent, only the people who really are from that area can do that accent. And I'm all for different actors doing different accents to where they are from. I'm all for that. That's just a tricky accent to do. And if the idea of, even though it's a clever idea of him looking like this villain, that should be so creative to me and I should love it, it somehow drags the story out more and I can't explain what it is. But I know it's a good story. I'm aware it's a good story. It's just not my favorite for because I'm human and I'm simply subjective. I, you know, no matter what I do, I'm always going to disagree with the populace for one reason or another every now and again. Just where it goes. And now we have at number six, we got The Edge of Destruction, the first Doctor's very third story. The Edge of Destruction does not get enough love. 
I see why. It's not a spectacular story, but The Edge of Destruction is still a very, very good story. The idea of the TARDIS is telling them something's wrong, and because of the Doctor pressing a button to try and take Ian and Barbara back to their time, there's a spring that was off in the TARDIS the entire time inside of that little the button, so now they keep going back and back and back and back and back prior to the beginning of the universe, event one even, probably. And as a result... The TARDIS was actually trying to warn them that it was heading back, 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 back to where they would all be destroyed, but somehow it's eating away at their minds, and it's affecting them in some strange way, and they think something is on, but we know this all at the very end, it all ties together at the very end, but up until that point, we, they're all at each other's throats, they're paranoid, the doctor is just horrible, and Susan, she's a little off herself, they think that Ian and Barbara are probably the problem, or, and Barbara says maybe there's something on board that is affecting our minds. There's maybe a monster there in the background. And it's very clever and has one of my favorite first Doctor speeches ever, or favorite Doctor Who speech, one of my favorites speeches ever. I think you should go back and really see that speech again. See that speech again. Oh, sometimes when I talk a little fast, enunciation gets lost in the shuffle. Um, yes, but there's that. But also with Edge of Destruction, forgive me for sounding like a broken record and being very redundant, but with the Edge of Destruction, I really do believe it inspired the 10th Doctor's story in his last season, Midnight. There are just so many similarities, and Midnight just feels like a reimagining to the Edge of Destruction. But that's simply a theory of mine. Okay, now we have, next up, we've got The Rescue. From the first Doctor's second season, The Rescue is another very good, oh, this is a very good story. And I love how, again, as it was with The Edge of Destruction, David Whitaker just took all the time he needed, which in this case, like Edge of Destruction, only two parts. I love my long stories, my four, six, and eight parters. I love those stories. But when you only have enough story for two episodes, put it down to two episodes. And the rescue was all the time it needed to tell that story. And what glows in this is the Doctor and Vicky. This is our very first story. And Vicky is wonderful with the first Doctor. This is where it just shows... William Hartnell did a damn good, couldn't throw out a damn good performance as the Doctor. It's just simply something about Vicky really triggers. I mean, he had many good moments before, but this one he just has consistently awesome moments. He is just wonderful in every single way. With Vicky, she brings something out of him. I just, I can't explain it, but it's like he shines with her if that makes any sense. And the story with Barbara shooting Vicky's pet, that's just unique. Like, David, how, how did you think of that? Like, where did you think of this? It's just so non-traditional. That's why I like it. It's non-traditional. I just, I'm sorry. It's, oh, that's just so cool. How, why would you think of that? Okay, sorry. I just think it's just so unique. And next we have up is the second Doctor's last story of his very first season, The Evil of the Daleks. Again, I'm going to sound like a broken record with this, but guys, with The Evil of the Daleks, once again, the Daleks are being written in a way where they are being perceived or treated as an invasion of people trapped in metal, these metal casing. But they have schemes that are very unique. They have plans and machinations that are very human-like, and therefore it gives them range of what you can achieve with their story. It's also Jamie. We see how heroic he is in this story. It's our first story with Victoria, the gorgeous Victoria. All the second Doctor's companions, um, his female companions, were all spell-bindingly gorgeous. But very good introduction to her as well. Very unique. But Jamie, we see Jamie stand up to the doctor and call him out for his callous and coldness. And he's like, if you're going to be like this, doctor, I do not want to travel with you. And that was just, it shows a different side to the second doctor that people often don't remember. Very good. Very touching. And then we have his number three. Okay, gosh, number three, it's so, oh, I just, number three, once again, it's another story that's completely missing, 
and it's painful and I'm so upset that Doctor Who I mean BBC did not save this story the wheel in space one of my if not my favorite Cyberman story it also introduced Zoe one Zoe and Jamie I love those two they're my favorite companions of the second doctor and one of my favorite TARDIS teams ever and it's just so well shot it, the, the telesnaps that I watched showed a very good production and it is a like I think about six part story or five or six parts it again it does not drag it is perfectly paced David Whitaker did a fantastic job with this story he really really did um, it's just so heartbreaking it's not been saved and speaking of stories that were not saved by BBC we have number two the power of the Daleks power of the Daleks a story that was completely missing then it was redone and as much as it was redone and I'm happy it was redone it, the animation because BBC did not give the animators enough time to give us a finished fully polished project it's animation at its most fundamental lowest of the low not complete in many ways shape or form I wish BBC just let them take a longer time doing this or thought to plan ahead and start scheduling animation for this in a lot longer t and give the animation team a longer time to do this and but what's more painful is that the animation not only does not live up to the story but it's a story that is a excellent story one of my favorite Dalek stories ever Ever. It's that good, great introduction to the second Doctor, great way to hold him over. Excellent, excellent way, and I love it. And now we are at our number one, one of my favorite third Doctor stories ever, The Ambassadors of Death. Now, David Whitaker wrote it, and it was um, co-written by Malcolm Hulk, I believe, but David Whitaker was like one of the principal, pretty much the principal writer, and he... I'm not going to speak too much about Ambassadors of Death. I talked about it before in my Malcolm Hulk video, but oh my gosh, guys, it is a phenomenal story. It is one of my favorite Third Doctor stories. Liz Shaw is awesome. The Brigadier, if you feel for him, he's great, but the Third Doctor is wonderful. The production value, the direction, the acting, it's all wonderful. Perfectly paced. Seven Parter never loses its momentum. Tom, it is an excellent addition to an all-around, overall, perfect season, which was season seven of Classic Who, the third Doctor's first season. Fantastic way to get you into the show. It was excellent in every way. I will say no more about it because I've said so much about that story before. But David Whitaker does not get nearly as much credit as he deserves, I think he does, he should get, as a Doctor Who writer. And I, this is a video... As it was with Robert Holmes, Malcolm Hulk, Terry Nation, Terrence Dix, honoring David Whitaker's contribution to Doctor Who. David, thank you so much for all that you did. You were awesome. Guys, see you again very soon with another video about my ranking of classic Doctor Who writers eventually. Bye, guys.